Uh, hello, uh, I'd like to say a few words about uh, uh, the hydrocodone acetaminophen uh, issue. Uh, I think the uh, major problem uh, is uh, stems from uh, uh, chronic pain syndrome, which is a very difficult stage of the pain to treat. It requires high doses of opioids and the uh, mixture of the hydrocodone with the uh, acetaminophen does not sit well uh, with, uh, with that uh, program. Uh, the stage of chronic pain and acute pain, uh, the uh, acetaminophen would be appropriate, but uh, it's not appropriate uh, with the hydrocodone in, uh, in the chronic uh, pain syndrome stage, uh, which is the exhaustion stage of the general adaptation syndrome. Uh, if we had the hydrocodone alone without the acetaminophen, we would have a, another medication that can be used. And with the shortage of opioids appearing in the market, uh, I think it would be beneficial to have uh, the hydrocodone alone. Uh, the acetaminophen-hydrocodone combination would be just fine for individuals with uh, chronic pain or acute pain, uh, since uh, they can be uh, controlled uh, rather easily. I have. Uh, made an illustration to show uh, the differences in, in this. Uh, the illustration is the pathophysiology of pain, which was developed uh, initially by Hans Selvey back in the, Selier back in the 1930s and pretty well developed by the 1950s. It has uh, the stages of <clears throat> the acute, the, uh, the adaptation, the exhaustion uh, stages, and uh, either uh, recovery or, or uh, death and it's this stage of recovery or death that is the problem. Uh, I'll uh, point out these uh, stages in this illustration. Uh, this uh, is the uh, opioid level needed to suppress pain and here we have the opiate level which is the drug uh, level to uh, relieve uh, pain and if a person uh, is uh, injured and goes into pain uh, the acute stage, the uh, opioid level, uh, will rise and, and if the uh, treatment is successful, the opioid level will drop to at its homeostatic level. Uh, it's always some present. But if the treatment is unsuccessful and the person goes into chronic pain, then the opioid uh, <clears throat> level needed uh, is uh, much smaller than it happens to be when the uh, person arrives uh, at the stage of exhaustion, uh, at this stage, the body is no, no longer able to produce the opioids, which is what this line depicts. It is no longer able to maintain the opioids, so to shore up the op opioid level, uh, more is needed here. Quite a bit of difference, which leads to a lot of problems. Uh, individuals are afraid to provide the patients with this much uh, medication. They wind up oftentimes repeating visits to emergency rooms, uh, going to the street to buy drugs, uh, not knowing how to take the drugs when they get them on the street because there's no prescription with them. And if they get the long acting uh, or the sustained release medications mixed up with the quick acting medications, uh, if they were taking the uh, uh, long acting ones in place of the short acting ones, as though they were short acting, then the drug piles up and can pile up very quickly and uh, be very uh, lethal. Uh, so uh, these are precautions that are needed. Uh, these people are out on, on the limb trying to get their pain managed, but uh, uh, I'm sure that a good deal of uh, the deaths we see with the opioid overdoses are related to that uh, inability to take the right dose or, the, uh, or, or, or and, uh, getting drugs uh, off the street. Now they shouldn't be having to get these drugs off the street. If the doctors would treat them properly, uh, we would uh, not have that problem. And uh, in 1987 it was discovered uh, that the doctors were a big problem by not treating the patients adequately, leaving them out to wander off for themselves and getting into trouble. This was, uh, and uh, they <clears throat> wind up going to the emergency rooms frequently uh, trying to get medications and, and they found that uh, a new uh, name was uh, provided in 1987, a pseudo addiction. And, uh, it, and it's clear now that uh, any statistics that has to deal with uh, addiction uh, has to uh, consider whether or not
pain was involved, in which case it most likely is pseudo-addiction and not addiction. Therefore, any statistics that only mentions addiction and give, comes out with numbers without comment about pain uh, is uh, invalid. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the process that begins with, uh, with pain uh, involves uh, genetic changes. And these pictures depict the genetic change that takes place in over about a six-month period. Usually it takes about six months for pain, persistent pain, to convert uh, the brain uh, from one stage to the other. Uh, CFOS is one of the uh, early, immediate early genes that appear. It may well be that, uh, that the sequence of immediate early genes that do uh, arise may reach a point where we can use that point as a biomarker for uh, the diagnosis of chronic pain syndrome. Uh, the other thing that develops, which I haven't mentioned here, is the hypothalamus swings into action with the onset of pain, putting out uh, uh, ACTH, uh, actually putting out pro-opiomelanocortin, which has ACTH, endorphin, MSH, LPH in them, uh, indicating that uh, we're going to have involvement of, uh, of uh, the uh, immune system and also the involvement of the um, uh, GI system, and then <clears throat> things become complicated and the whole body starts to collapse and that's part of this exhaustion here. Uh, the, all the uh, organs are now involved in a degenerative process and can very well lead to death either by the disease itself or by suicide because people in this stage are frowned upon, they're called addicts, they're uh, socially outcasted, uh, they're trying to do what they can and they can't do it well. And, and so they'll uh, commit suicide. Uh, I'm uh, sorry to, to see that sort of thing happening and what has me worried is also all this we hear about the uh, soldiers coming back and having post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and com chronic pain syndrome are the same except chronic pain syndrome has pain involved and there's no pain in post-traumatic stress disorder. If there were pain it would be chronic pain syndrome. So I don't know what's happening with our soldiers coming back, but that's worried me for some time. Uh, I, I, I hope I've uh, made my, uh, my ideas clear. Uh, I've had a lot of experience in, uh, in treating pain, uh, 33 years. 33 years of, of, of uh, experience treating pain, uh, starting at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory where I treated chronic uh, pain and diabetics with their neuropathy, and hospice care for 10 years, uh, and uh, pain in my own clinical office for eight years. And I uh, have found that uh, chronic pain, uh, all my patients, by the way, uh, were patients with chronic pain syndrome. I weeded them out uh, because uh, these are people who are, who are very eager to get treated. They're not apt to do anything improper. Uh, for eight years, they have not not one of them has misused drugs that uh, anyone knows, uh, and uh, they've done very well. Uh, I've gotten out of their wheelchairs, some of them, all of them out of their beds. Many of them have thrown away their walkers and uh, and canes. My email is uh, emanujan at comcast.net. Uh, my phone number is 510-525-4630. I do have an article I wrote for the California Department of Rehabilitation, which I'm willing to send to anyone who, who wants it. Uh, it's an introduction to chronic pain syndrome. It goes into the details, more into the genetic and other changes that take place. Uh, the syndrome is not clear as to how it develops. Some uh, think that it's an aspect of long-term potentiation, producing long-term memory of the pain. Other thoughts are that it's uh, failure of the glial cells to clear the uh, glutamate, and uh, another one is that it's substance P that uh, the nerve themselves put out, which is inflammatory and keeps the process going. But this is all being worked on now. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, the immediate early genes, which come out sequentially and disappear, the new ones uh, come out, the old ones disappear, and at one point, if we can get a biomarker to establish that the person has reached chronic pain, syndrome, then we would have a more definite uh, diagnosis. Right now we're relying on things like the official uh, disabilities guideline, 
which says that if an uh, injured person can't get back to work within 90% of the time other people get back to work, that 10% probably uh, has a high likelihood of uh, chronic pain syndrome. Uh, and uh, the other is the six-month issue, but that depends on how bad the pain is. You imagine a person with, uh, with pain, a t t toothache for, uh, for six months is not very likely, uh, but uh, that would be pretty devastating. Acetaminophen for people with chronic pain and for acute pain would be perfectly all right uh, with the hydrocodone because uh, the uh, doses needed at that level are not as great as the chronic pain syndrome patients. Uh, with the shortage of drugs nowadays, uh, it seems that uh, having hydrocortisone alone, uh, which is a very good uh, uh, pain uh, relieving medication, uh, should be available. That's all I have to say. Thank you.